The Joyful Friar podcast is made possible by the generous support of our friends. To support the podcast, please visit nathan-castle.com and donate today. Hi, and welcome to this episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm your host, Father Nathan Castle, and today I have Dr. Jan Holden with me. Um, I'm eager for you to get to know her and for me to get to know her better. We're acquainted through our membership in IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, and you're the current president, correct? That's right. And um, I was invited to speak to the local IONS chapter in Dallas uh, within the past year, I think. Wasn't it last winter? Yeah, that's right. Um, and Jan, Jan and her husband hosted me in their home, so that was uh, how we got a little better acquainted. So today, I am uh, I want to get to know her better and give you an opportunity to uh, make a new friend. Uh, Dr. Holden has uh, all kind, of, well, first of all, you, your website is www.janholden.com, H-O-L-D-E-N. And anybody that after this uh, episode wants to know more about you, it's very well laid out and it explains a lot of your interests. But uh, along the top of it, it says that you are a near-death experiencer and transpersonal pioneer researcher. That's right. Tell us a little bit about that and how that became your um, the way that you introduce yourself to the world. Yeah. Well, actually, that was my web designer's recommendation to refer to myself as a pioneer. And uh, and uh, there actually are other people who deserve that title more than I do. But I was in uh, pretty much toward the beginning of research on, in the field. So I had started out, I was, um, uh, well, just to a little background that I was always interested in things that couldn't be easily explained. And yeah. so I read about, you know, um, Edgar Casey and uh, mysticism and things like that in high school, uh, even junior high. And then in uh, college, when I was in college, home for the summer, my father had read a book called The Great Soul Trial. And it's a fascinating nonfiction book about something that actually happened in your neck of the woods in Arizona. This uh, around 1960, um, this uh, reclusive miner named James Kidd had uh, had a little just a one room in uh, Phoenix, and he would provision up and then go out and mine and then come back just to get more provisions, go to the bank and all that. And he'd really be out in the mountains um, two to three months at a time. So he went off one day and then never came back. And after seven years, the state of Arizona opened his safe deposit box and found there several hundred thousand dollars and a handwritten note that he wanted the money used for research. He wrote this research on the survival of the human soul after death. So the state of Arizona put a, um, an ad in the paper just to um, a notification you know a little tiny thing thinking nobody would see it and they'd get to keep the money <laughs> <laughs> right and um but actually over a hundred individuals and organizations came forward to try to claim the money so the state of arizona actually put on a trial where a judge heard all these people come and testify how they would use the money and then he decided who was going to get the money. And so uh, there's another longer, a little bit longer story that's very interesting about cosmic, um, um, cosmic, I don't know, synchronicity or something. Uh, but but the, the main thing is that in this book, most of the book is the actual testimony from the trial about people like the head of research from the um, American Society for Psychical Research, the Psychical Research Foundation, testifying how they would use this money to uh, research this question. So it was very fascinating to me as an undergraduate in psychology studying behaviorism, which is just about the most opposite thing from um, studying the survival of the human soul after death, as you can get. Uh -huh. But it it sort of planted a seed. So uh, when I read Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life in 1978, uh, I 
um, became really interested in near-death experiences. And then much longer story, much shorter, when I was finishing my doctorate in counselor education, I was work looking for a, a dissertation topic and ended up doing my dissertation on near-death experiences. And it just, I was hooked. Now, a what year would that have been? When did you choose that topic? I chose the topic probably around 1986, and I finished my degree in 88, 1988. All right. So that's about a decade after Raymond Moody wrote. That's right. And were you And was that how you began to meet some of the other kind of luminaries, founders of IONS? Exactly. In fact, when it came time to publish my dissertation, I had, I had, of course, in the process of my research, stumbled onto the Journal of Near-Death Studies, which I didn't even know existed. And I submitted my first uh, manuscript there for publication. And the editor was Bruce Grayson, uh, the psychiatrist who recently wrote uh, his memoir, his professional memoir about being an NDE researcher titled After. Yes. And uh, yeah. And so he um, he and I, I became, um, you know, professional friends. And then uh, about, I don't know, 12 or I, I do, I've lost count now years ago, he asked me if I would assume editorship of the journal. I was just so going to say that you not only submitted a paper to it, you became its editor eventually. That's right. That's right. So that's that's the work. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing over the past many years. So since uh, getting finishing my doctorate in '88, uh, I finished that spring and that fall. I started uh, my academic position on faculty at the. University of North Texas in the counseling program. So in that program, we prepare counselors to work in private practice, in schools, and in other settings. And uh, and so I did that for 31 years and then uh, retired in 2019. A lot of people don't realize that a professor's job actually has three equal parts to it, and teaching is only one third of it. Uh, another third is service. And that, for example, um, I was president of IONS uh, once before some years back, and that's part of that service um, obligation. And then the other third is research. And so my research focus was the counseling implications of near-death experiences and related experiences. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, it seems like it might be kind of a narrow title, but it's actually very broad because Counseling, for example, is based in a philosophy of um, life. And so uh, near-death experiences definitely um, have something to say about the nature of reality and who we really are. And so, um, so that interfaces with uh, counseling. It isn't just what happens in the counseling room if somebody who had an NDE discloses that. It's a lot, a lot bigger. Yes. I have one of my prayer partners is a counselor who, whose practice is, she has a specialty of working with people that have had NDEs or other spiritually transformative experiences because um, they, they're a niche that has specific needs about how they might approach counsel. Exactly right. Yeah, so true. And uh, part of what we're doing uh, we one of the things we just did at through IANS, the, as you said, the International Association for Near Death Studies, is uh, people who are licensed mental health professionals in the U.S. who have particular educational preparation to work with people who've had transpersonal experiences. I prefer that term to spiritually transformative, um, but it's essentially the same thing um, uh, that they can apply to be on a listing that we're about to put up on the IONS website. And I think our first round of applicants, we have about a dozen um, people listed from representing, I think, seven different states so far. So right. any of your listeners who might be licensed mental health professionals in the U.S. with spe uh, specific educational preparation around working with clients with transpersonal experiences 
are welcome to apply and they can find the application at the IANS website. Oh, that's great to know. That wouldn't apply to me because I don't have the academic credentials yeah. uh, that, that would be necessary, but maybe that could be something down the line for spiritual counseling practitioners a lot. But what I found is that, uh, you know, I, I had psychology courses as an undergrad, uh, and then I was in counseling twice in psychotherapy, twice in my 20s. And then my experience of being a counselee really fed my ability to be a, a, a pastoral counselor. And a lot of people don't have the, um, I don't know, either the either the culture culture availability to go to a, a, a certified counselor, it's just not done in their family or their their group of whatever. And then sometimes they just don't have the um, the insurance or the ability to pay. And yeah. so oftentimes uh, people that are, might be in the pastoral field end up filling in gaps for folk that don't have access to yeah to practitioners absolutely i i'm very aware even though as a as a professional counselor my position is that counseling is should be a a protected field you know blah 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 the reality is that some people are just naturals and uh and the the letter and and Conversely, some people have been through our uh, master's program that I wouldn't send my, you know, my worst enemy to them as a counselor. Sure, sure. So, that's always tricky. Yeah, it's it's always tricky. So, um, but it is it's something for us to consider down the road to expand beyond. Uh, you know, we wanted to, for liability reasons, stick with the the most um, the safest group to of start course. with. Sure. And then, and we may expand beyond that. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're doing a great work. So thanks, sir, for doing that. I used to uh, recommend accounts to people. They would come to me and I would be the first person they talked to. But if I felt like what they needed was beyond my competence uh, or might require more of my time than I felt I had to give to any one person while I was doing a lot of other things, I would I would ask them to to pray to the Holy Spirit for a signal grace that is a little sign. Go make an appointment with somebody, but before you even go in the room, pray for a signal grace to know whether you're with the right person or not. And mm -hmm. by the end of that 50 minute hour, maybe you'll know whether to make the next appointment with them or to keep going. Yeah. Because it's wow, too that's... easy for people to say, well, I went to a counselor and they didn't click and I, you know, they can sometimes write off counseling completely because they had one dissatisfying experience of it yeah yeah oh absolutely it's important for people to realize that it's a trial and error process and it's like dating you know you don't expect to marry the first person you date if, no. if you're looking for a marriage partner you no. know it's it's going to be a trial and error process and it's true with any interpersonal kind of situation yes all right so you were that you were that young college student and then a PhD student who uh, found yourself uh, interested enough in near death and other kinds of, were, were you using the word transpersonal at that point in your life? I was, because yeah. actually when I finished my master's degree in counseling, I was burned out and I, I thought never again am I going to go back to school. And this was back in the days when they would actually send you a hard copy of the um, the schedule of classes, and so after I graduated, <clears throat> they uh, this was uh, Northern Illinois University kept sending me um, these schedules, and and I you know the first couple I just tossed, then I looked through one or two, and one day I just was glancing through it, and I saw a course called Transpersonal Perspective in Education and Counseling, and this was probably around. 1978, because that's when I started my doctoral degree. And so I thought, oh, that would be fun to take just as a as an interesting course. Well, it it launched me into my doctoral studies. And uh, and there was a faculty member who was uh, knowledgeable about transpersonal phenomena. And in fact, too, the, the the man that I took the 
course from and then the woman who was on the council he was not on the counseling faculty he was on the ed psych faculty and then she was or teacher education and she was on the counseling faculty and she taught courses in psychosynthesis and i ended up taking about four or five courses focused on transpersonal issues and so that word was um early in my development and it's the, re the reason I prefer it to spiritually transformative is that some people who have these kinds of experiences do not consider them spiritual and feel very offended if that if that term is foisted onto them. I see. And, would, yeah. you, would you define it? We're using it a lot now, but I don't know if we adequately defined it for people that haven't heard it before. Trans means beyond yeah. and personal means personal. So it's beyond experiences that involve something beyond the usual personal limits of space, time, identity, or influence. So for example, if I um, can do remote viewing and see something that's happening far away um, that I have no other knowledge of, um, that's I'm transcending the usual personal limits of space because usually I can't see beyond you know what what my eyes uh, in yes. the range of my eyes. Um, if I remember a past life, that I've transcended the usual limits of time. Uh, if I have a mystical experience in which my sense of myself expands beyond this little ego. Yes. I've transcended the usual limits of of uh, identity. And if I can move something with intention without touching it, that's psychokinesis and that's uh, transcending the usual limits of influence. So it, it just is a, a term that encompasses every kind of phenomenon that's associated with those kinds of things, out-of-body experiences, after-death communication, um, precognition, telepathy, just all those things fall into that uh, that topic. Would precognition, I, I get, because of my podcast and being on a lot of other people's podcasts, people move through my website and bring me their uh, first-person narrative story. And one of them just in the last few days was of a, a man who um had a visit from a friend who was dying but saw her in a field of puppies <laughs> she was being licked by a bunch of puppies and she was radiant and so on and she spoke to him and said and i'm i'm here with your dog um... and he woke up from this dream and got a call from his mother saying she passed during the night yeah. Right, right, right. He, he said that was the thing. In his case, he did interpret that in, in spiritual, a spiritual way, confirming the reality of, of life after death. And that was, in, he was talking to a priest, you know, uh, and so he was, he, he made mean to say, that's the thing that brought me back to church was yeah. having this dream that kind of, that affirmed for him that uh, the message that there is life after death that one might hear in Christian churches was enough to make him give that a second look. Wow, that is really wonderful. And yeah, and and one of the things I like about the word transpersonal is that if somebody wants to um, percept, uh, perceive of their experience as spiritual, there's plenty of room for that. They just don't have to. Of course. And so, yeah, and that's a wonderful um, anecdote. The, uh, that's what, I don't know if you're familiar, and you might want to actually do this um, in the future is interview William at uh, Shared Crossing because they uh, research shared death experiences, which is exactly what that man who wrote to you, uh, it would fall into that category. He shared in her dying process remotely, uh, psychically, and uh, and at so many things about that experience fit what William Peters uh, yes. has found that the experiences are uh, most people do um, consider them spiritual. They're very um, reassuring 
and uh, and life changing in positive ways. And uh, they take different, a few different forms. That's one one type of shared death experience. I think you'd really enjoy um, interviewing him. Is he at um, at UC Santa Barbara? He is in Santa Barbara. I don't know if he's at UC. Um, the Sh Shared Crossing Initiative is an independent organization, okay. so it's not affiliated with the university. Did he was he an academic? Did, was he? I don't think university? he was. No. no, he he has a master's degree, um, and I don't I don't even know whether he's adjuncted or or anything like that. He's also a marriage and family therapist, uh -huh. so he. And he has a really interesting history. You'd have a lot of fun talking to him. I bet so. Well, thanks for that recommendation. I see um, my, it, you know, we broaden as we do. We meet more people and all these podcasts and stuff for me is just a new part of my world. But I now my inbox is full of recommendations from other people. you got to look at this website. you got to see this video and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a thousand a day to do all of it. And But <laughs> I'm on, I think I'm on his list because he keeps showing up in my world one of these days. I'll follow through on that. Sounds yeah. good. Sounds good. Well, yeah. uh, we've talked some about how you got started in this field, but then um, for much of your career, you were training people to be counselors, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things I did at my university was developed a course on the transpersonal perspective in counseling. Yeah. And I've taught it every other year for oh, probably 20 years. And so um, trying to prepare counselors for uh, working with clients who've had transpersonal experiences. And what the, the students at the end of the course, you know, at, at every university, I think they do this now where at the end of the course, the students provide anonymous feedback. So you don't know who's writing it and they can be free to say whatever they want to. Yeah. And the two things that, that uh, the students from this course say most often is number one, this course changed my life, which, you know, as a teacher, you know that that no one could say anything more um, valuable to you as a teacher than to know that this course changed their life in a positive way. And the other thing is that uh, they say, I shudder to think how I would have responded to a client disclosing a, new, a, a transpersonal experience prior to this class. Now I feel prepared to do it. I had no idea what I didn't know. Uh, and so it really it really seems to open a lot of vistas for for people and help sure. them feel. Warm. And once they know a little bit of what they didn't know, then that can create an appetite for <laughs> wanting to know more and seeking it out. Absolutely. And in fact, the the we always grieve the end of this course. You know, we we all feel sad that it's over because we're not going to be continuing to meet and talk about these, you know, wonderful topics. And uh, I've had a couple classes over the years where they didn't want to stop and we kept meeting uh, for lunch periods. You know, one of them went on for like a year afterwards. And so, um, so it's a, it's a, it's a really meaningful experience. What I've begun to do with stuff like that is to say, well, it's true. We're all too busy and this is over or we have other things to do, but what if we got together in the afterlife? <laughs> That's a great idea. Let's have an afterlife one where we're all at leisure. Uh, nobody's, uh, you know, everybody's welcome. It doesn't cost anything. We don't have to travel. Uh, we can just we'll, be here. That's we'll, one of my, uh, my if, in religious language, it would be one of the joys of heaven that j yeah. just being able to be with anybody that you wanted to be with for as long as you wanted to be with them, doing yeah. whatever it was that uh, that gave you joy. Yeah, for endless time. When you taught that course over 20 years, uh, how was it different at the end of that span than it was at the beginning? Was there a way in which your thoughts grew or changed, morphed? That's a really good question. Um, not that not that I'm really aware of. I think the students have changed um, and somewhat. And like the most recent class, um, whereas originally the students, the, there'd be about a third of the students would, would come to the class saying, 
I don't know if I'm on board with this, but I want to take the class to find out, you know, what's what. And by the end of the class, almost all of them were like, oh, I get this. Uh -huh. um, but uh, this last class, I only had one student like that. Everybody else was like very transpersonally experienced uh, people who had done um, meditation retreats and uh, and psychedelic retreats and just had had a host of experiences. And one of the things that I do in the classes, uh, everybody writes their uh, transpersonal autobiography. Wow. So um, reviewing their life with a focus on their transpersonal experiences throughout life and how they have affected the person. And at the the last two classes we spend, everybody gives about a 15 or 20 minute highlight of their, um, of their autobiography. And it is one of the most, I mean, there, when those, those classes happen, it's like, there's no place else on earth. I would rather be right. than right there hearing these meaningful experiences, you know, of these people and learning about them. Um, it, it's just, really been wonderful for me that's often been on retreats you mentioned the word retreat and i was a campus minister most of my career and when you do exit interviews at graduation what were some of the most important things that happened during your college career i'm usually talking to people that were active at a catholic campus ministry center and very often they'll say it was that retreat or it was that service project the time we went to that place and met other people and did something that I didn't know about. But retreats in particular, I, my one of my most important early in life uh, transpersonal experience was, was on a retreat at 18 years old. And I was a, a senior in high school, but uh, it was at the local college. Actually, it was Lamar in uh, Beaumont in Texas. And, um, and on it, they were, it was a group of college students that for the weekend pretended to be mom and dad and they put us in groups we were all high school seniors and this was something that college students were doing for high school seniors and they they put us in these family groups and for the weekend we talked about our family life and i had no idea that was what it was going to be when i went into it it was a, it was a catholic retreat so i thought it would be safe it would be about commandments and and i don't know uh sacraments and prayers or whatever and and then when I, and I couldn't leave, <laughs> I'd, been, I'd been brought there. I didn't have my own car. Right. And, and, uh, I, they said, the theme of the weekend is what do you think about your parents? And I just had no idea that people talked out loud in public about <laughs> such things. things. <laughs> and I needed to, I really did. I was about to go off to college uh, at my parents' expense with a, with a, with almost no relationship with my father, even though I was in his household. I just didn't know how to talk to him and he didn't know how to talk to me. And and uh, and during that, the, I kind of confessed a closed heart. I said, I gave up five years ago. I got angry and gave up. And now I'm about to leave his house in a once and for all moment. I mean, and I was right. I only ever came back as a guest, you know. It's, yeah. it's still a kind of your home, but I I left and, and I came back to visit. <laughs> uh, so I, I I felt like I needed to do that well, and I just confessed to this group of people that listened uh, that I don't know how to talk to him, but I needed to try. And um, and then they brought because of this Catholic retreat, they brought in a priest and said, "Anybody want to go to confession?" Well, I hadn't done that in about five years, but I thought, you know, I just did that. <laughs> I just yeah. did it to a group. I think yeah. I could repeat the short version of it because I've already done the, the heavy lifting. So I did that with his priest and he did the absolution that I know how to do. Um, uh, and then when we went to mass, you know, we went to communion and our belief is that we're receiving the fullness of God. However you imagine that into your own little person, in fact, into your mouth, <laughs> into your gut, into your cells. And when I did that, as I had since first grade, I had an out of body, everything. It, it was, it was right in the middle of church. It, it wasn't in a dream. It wasn't on a mountaintop. It was just going to communion at church. And and it blew me open. And I went home and woke my dad up and had the conversation that we hadn't ever had. And uh, in fact, he he um, he died of Parkinson's disease and was 
uh, he was non-communicative for maybe a year, year and a half. But um, he spoke to me the week after he died. Wow. And he said, um, whatever you did that day, do more of it. It's really important. Um, wow. So, uh, so that happened at church. <laughs> and yeah. so sometimes I challenge Catholic people because I'm a worship leader in the Catholic church. And I'll say, what if you had a, anybody ever had a spiritual experience at church? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems like it ought to happen here. And yeah. I challenge them sometimes if you, if you come here with some sort of church manners or church expectations that are rather low or that this is going to be a day like every other day, nothing special, nothing to see here. Try Try turning it on its nose. <laughs> try try doing something different and open yourself to a different kind of experience. Maybe maybe letting go of a grudge or setting aside some certainty of yours that maybe you've been wrong. When's the last time you have been wrong about anything important? When did you last change your mind? Well, uh, anyway, uh, it it uh, it's it's animated my career to be able to to be inside the churches and say. You know, you don't have to go uh, on some arcane uh, vision quest because <laughs> if God is everywhere and you're here, well, God can find you right here if you want to be found. Absolutely. Absolutely. And can you tell uh, I'm a preacher, by the way. Yeah, I, I do. I can tell that. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but you're reminding me of a good friend of mine who also is Catholic and she what she and her husband were in a really bad a financial situation at one point and uh, really didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, she, they went to church and she said during the service, she was praying and she felt a hand distinctly on her shoulder, squeezing her shoulder and conveying that everything would be okay. And she, when she opened her eyes and looked back, there was nobody behind her. And within the following week, all these things happened that everything worked out just fine. Mm -hmm. And so, so absolutely those experiences can happen in church and they, they happen really everywhere. Of course it is. Can, yeah. But can happen in church for sure. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm near the end of our time together. I want to make sure that you have a chance to say the thing you most want to say, if you haven't said it already. Oh my goodness. Um, just boy, time has flown. Um, <laughs> We can do it again if you like. Yeah, well, I would be happy to. I, um, we haven't talked specifically about near-death experiences. Maybe you, you've you already talked about that topic with other people. And another topic that I talk about uh, that I've researched is after-death communication, mm -hmm. um, which you just gave an example of your father communicating right. with you after his passing. So I'd be happy to come back anytime you'd like. Well, and those don't happen to just some uh, odd subset of the population. You don't have to be some woo-woo person that's all into their meditations and their crystals or whatever. It happens to all kinds of people. One of the things I love about IONS is that when you're with a, a group of IONS people, it's like jury duty. You're just thrown together with, with everybody, you know, yeah. uh, you, yeah. you're, and everybody has a story to tell and they can tell it in a safe place where nobody's going to make fun or call them crazy. You know? Exactly right. Yeah. And there is something, uh, you know, I, I know we're, we're talking in August and, and this program is probably going to air in January. Our um, annual conference is Labor Day. So for me, it's coming up soon and, but we have it every year. Uh, and uh, the, in fact, next year, 2024 is going to be in the Phoenix, Arizona area. Oh, sweet. So it's going to be right in your backyard. Um, and uh, there is something special about that conference. I, I have told the story that um, some the, the counseling program I was at at, at UNT uh, specialized in play therapy, which is counseling children ages two to 10 using play a playroom with toys and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're world renowned for that. It's the number one play therapy program in the world. And so I had students in my transpersonal class who had, uh, had, uh, who were specializing actually in that, but they also took the transpersonal class. And so one year, a few of them came with me to the IONS conference. And about 
the third day into the conference, they pulled me aside and they said, you know, you would think that people who are dedicated to the welfare of children, when they get together for a conference, there would be this feeling of esprit and connection and and uh, shared dedication and all that. And, and they said, but that's not what it's like. There's actually a lot of political infighting and yeah. stuff like that. It's not that wonderful. But they said here at the IONS conference, there's this spirit of connectedness and and that that we just love. And yeah. I've, I've experienced that every time. I feel like I'm with my own kind when I'm there, whatever yeah. that means, because yeah. I'm a universal, I try to be a universal person to begin with. I don't want there to, I don't want anybody to not be my kind, but yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a wonder when you're at, at that conference. And uh, I would say in closing, I-A-N-D-S, just look it up. Uh, it's uh, ions.org. Isn't that the website? Yes. Uh, it also has local chapters in many metropolitan areas. There's a lot of online program if you're not in a big city or where there's a small group. Um, I've compared the local IONS experience to something like a 12-step program where you can walk in right off the street and just take a seat and be welcomed. And yes. you can either speak or not speak about what you uh, might have to say, test it out. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, I do need to stop and I'm the one that's talking. So I need to <laughs> and make this show come to an end. So uh, I'd like to say to the audience, if you would like to know more about Dr. Holden's work or things that we didn't talk about today, you can email me uh, through my website, uh, info at nathan com, and say, she was fascinating, and I'd like to know more about X. That might help us to uh, get you back and tee up another conversation. Sounds great. I'd love okay. it. All right. Well, for right now, I'm going to say goodbye to, to this audience. Thank you for being with us today on the Joyful Fire podcast. Um, if there's anything that, that I can do for you, please contact me through the website, nathan castlecom Until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Joyful Friar. Please like, follow, and subscribe. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. God bless.